Who is the worst team in the country? Today, college football imperialism is back, but the new twist is if you lose, you stay. It is time to load up NCAA football, and how this works is I'll spin this wheel to pick a team, which then leads to this wheel deciding which direction they'll be attacking. In our example, North Texas ended up going Northwest, so this will be the first of 125 matchups in this video, and remember, the loser is the team that stays. Evidently, North Texas didn't get the memos, they're trying to pull off the upset, and with a minute remaining, it is a tie game, but they they have the ball and they pretty much control their own destiny. Their quarterback's going to scramble for well over 20 yards here with a stiff arm as well, getting them closer and closer to being in field goal range, which would give them the lead. Now he is slinging it and they get in the end zone again. So I guess they really want to win, but Dylan Gabriel will have a chance to respond back with 38 seconds left. He's already getting them near midfield. And if Oklahoma wants to stay in it, they'd be better off just running out the rest of the clock. So they lose here on the last play of the game. They have to go for the Hail Mary and the ball is up, but it is going to be knocked down and North Texas is going to be eliminated because they won. It is a very strange concept, but losing actually benefited Oklahoma, and hopefully you all understand the concept of this now, because we're about to start flying through these, and next up, we're going south. Northern Illinois is going to have to play the Illini, and I set this up so smaller teams could compete for a championship, but that's not what's happening. Northern Illinois cruised to a pretty easy win over Illinois, and now they won't have a chance at winning something that was intended for tinier programs. I'm not sure why the bigger schools have done well so far, but if one of them wins college football imperialism for the worst team, that would be pretty funny. Another Matt College Buffalo is on the board next, and there's no way that Penn State doesn't thrash them. I have no words. It is fourth and ten, three minutes remaining. Buffalo is only down by three, and they are going to pick up the first down, so I can't even begin to explain what is possibly going on right now. I swear, if Penn State loses this, I'm going to be speechless. They're going down by four, and the ball is in the hands of Sean Clifford, who on third and nine is going to deliver a dart over the middle. The play calling has honestly just been really strange and it's fourth and ten so the game is on the line they're going with the halfback screen and buffalo is going to get the stop we have another upset on our hands and this one doesn't even make sense the bulls were a 68 overall team but now they're eliminated a lot of weird things have happened in imperialism but this has to be the strangest and surely this one doesn't turn into an upset as well it's missouri versus iowa state so i'm not sure there can be one and it's also coming down to the wire as with a minute remaining the cyclones are down by four but they're threatening the score which they're going to do sam horn and missouri are going to need to get in field goal range if they want to send this game into overtime they're going to pick up the first down and more but with 14 seconds left they are on another third and five they are also going with the halfback screen which is a common play call we've seen and i don't know if they're going to be able to get into field goal range they're going to need a big pickup which they do get so their kicker is going to come onto the field and this one's going to ot these teams have been going back and forth and it looks like the tigers are going to continue to get into the end zone so that puts the pressure here on the cyclones on fourth and three their quarterback has plenty of time he is going to sling it and it's going to be deflected meaning missouri is going to get the win and the cyclones are going to stay alive in the loser's version of college football imperialism. There's a lot of red in the middle of the U.S. now, and the next team that will be taking the field is going to be LSU. I would assume that they're going to get the win here and then get out of the tournament, especially since they're taking on Southern Miss. Well, I guess I can't even act surprised anymore. Southern Miss is somehow in this game, and I don't think they're going to pull this off, but we have seen crazier. Their quarterback is taking off, and he is going to lose the football. LSU's linebacker is going to pick it up. He's going to break free, and I don't think anybody's going to catch him. He's going to go to the house. So we finally got an expected result. The Tigers got out as quick as they could, and after a really strange beginning, we're starting to return to normality. Wyoming is up now, and we can probably expect them to lose, but the arrow spun them into unclaimed territory, so they just get to take this over without playing anybody. That's something that rarely happens, but we do see it every so often, but Tulsa's in the middle of a bunch of teams, so they won't be able to do that. Instead, they have to play Oklahoma State, and it looks like they're going for a late comeback, but I don't think they're going to pull this one off. There's the interception, which will seal the deal and that means Oklahoma State can't end up being the worst team in the game. Only six teams have been eliminated so far, so you better grab some popcorn because we know this is going to be a long one and Louisville is playing now. They're actually playing my Wildcats, so this should be interesting. And this has to be the most embarrassing and inaccurate result ever. My favorite team still being in the running for being the worst team in the game, along with losing by 35 to our rivals, is not what I was expecting. But with Western Kentucky still on the map, we aren't the worst team in Kentucky yet. If they actually end up being that, I'm going to be very unhappy. But for now, 
now we're headed over to Mormon country where BYU is, and I think the tip of the arrow is gonna rub along the corner of Utah. With a minute remaining to everybody surprise, the Utes are trailing by eight, but the ball is in the hands of Cam Rising, and here on fourth and 10, after a terrible third down play call, he is throwing it deep, but it is going to be swatted, so the Mormons are gonna secure their victory. It's still throwing me off that the loser is the one that stays, but I am determined to figure out the worst team using imperialism. With this arrow spin, Memphis could be going in many different directions, and it's a close call, but I believe it touches Iowa State's territory. The Cyclones have already lost once in this, but they must be determined to make sure that doesn't happen again. With a minute remaining, Memphis is down 10, and they're gonna do nothing here, so the Cyclones are out of this thing, and it's safe to say it happened extremely fast, but the Tigers are now the second biggest team on the map. Next up, on the wheel spin, we're going to get to see UCLA play, and there's a lot of good teams in California, so we'll see where this goes, which honestly got us the perfect matchup. Or so I thought. Caleb Williams wanted nothing to do with being part of the worst team, and he made sure USC was taken out almost immediately. It's unfortunate a player as talented as Caleb Williams won't be a part of this, but he's on a stacked team, so we couldn't have expected that to happen. Old Dominion and James Madison should be a good game, though, and with a minute remaining, the Monarchs have a one-point lead. They need to get a fourth down stop, but they don't do it, and I'm honestly surprised that was marked as a first. It was a close call, but it looks like James Madison is going to get in field goal range and make sure they win this. However, instead of hiking the ball, they ran the clock all the way down to about 12 seconds, so I don't understand that decision. They're going to drop the ball, and could they be blowing this game so they still have a chance at winning something and being the worst team in college football? This Hail Mary is going to get knocked down, and assuming they don't pick this up, Old Dominion's going to be eliminated. They're going to stay alive, and that's that. The Dukes are the first team in this that actually want to be the last team standing, and I think Old Dominion's like the second worst team in the game, so that's a surprising result. Arizona football's on the board next, and keep in mind this isn't basketball, so I was thinking they were set to lose, but they are playing against Hawaii. With a minute remaining, the Rainbow Warriors are trailing by four, but they have the ball, but after quarterback Cameron Cooper took back-to-back -back sacks, Hawaii is in a terrible position, and it all comes down to this fourth and 23, where they go with the halfback draw, so the Rainbow Warriors have now become a part of mainland USA. You know what, I'm gonna become their biggest hater and root for them to lose, but it'll probably be a while before they can play again, and next up is Air Force. They're gonna be traveling to Colorado, and it seems like every single game has been close, but I'm not gonna complain about that. Air Force is on third and three with 67 seconds remaining. They need to pick this up, their quarterback sails it, and I know he's not used to throwing the ball, but he needs to step up big time here, and he's not gonna be able to. I'm honestly surprised the Buffaloes got the win, considering they went 1-11, but they've been eliminated by winning, which is a good thing. I can't quite remember which schools are around Temple, but I think they're trapped, and I guess I was wrong because they're playing against Army. What I thought would be a winnable game for them has turned into this, where they're gonna lose, and Army's the first military school to get out of this. They wanted nothing to do with potentially becoming the worst team in the game, and I feel like all the favorites for winning this thing are being eliminated. UTEP is another one of them, so we will see how they do, and Texas Tech should mop them. It is the fourth quarter, and the Miners just scored, so the expected result is what ended up actually happening. They just gained a ton of territory, and after 15 teams have been eliminated, this is what the map of the U.S. looks like. There's still 110 that need to go, so we have a while, but for now, we have to see where South Alabama is gonna travel, and they're gonna be playing against Southern Miss. The Golden Eagles have already lost once, and they're gonna double down on being bad by getting their backs blown out by the Jaguars. Their reward for being terrible is even more land, and of course, now we have to head back over to the wheel where Western Kentucky has been drawn and they're going to be going near Kentucky. Now, unfortunately, the arrow directs them to Middle Tennessee State, so my Wildcats are still stuck in this thing, but I think the Hilltoppers will be as well because with 12 seconds left, they have the ball. They're trailing by four and they're getting out of bounds, but it really doesn't matter because there's not much time for them left to do anything, and why is Bailey Zappi still in the game? He throws it deep, but it's an incompletion, and I'm just confused because I'm almost certain he played for the Patriots this past season. There's still two teams left in Kentucky, though, and I cannot believe it just landed on Western Kentucky again. This time, the arrow's gonna direct them through this little gap to Memphis, and I think with the Tigers being in this terrible position, the Hilltoppers are gonna be able to escape with a win. To be fair, I think they have an NFL quarterback on their team, so they should be able to, and here on 4th and 11, Seth Hennigan is gonna sling it, but they're gonna be marked way short. Well, that result makes it so Kentucky is somehow the worst team in the state, and Memphis has lost so much, they've now taken over five different territories. Surely, sooner rather than later, they're gonna end up getting out. But for now, we have Georgia Southern playing. I'm hoping they land on Georgia, but Florida also works just as well. I am rooting for a massive upset, and the fact that there's still a chance it could potentially happen as time ticks down is really wild. There isn't a planet where this game should be a contest, but they need to spike the ball, and I think it's pretty concerning my Colts' future quarterback, Anthony Richardson, has only put up 14 points. I'm pretty sure Georgia Southern's a 
32 overall team, so they're not great, but this is the final play, and the Gators are gonna survive. They avoided getting embarrassed at home, and maybe I have terrible memory, but I feel like we haven't gotten an upset in a while. I really look forward to them because it just keeps the big schools in here longer, but at least we should be getting a good game with this matchup. I always mix these two colleges up, but it turns out that UTSA is much better than UTEP, so I'll keep that in mind. The University of Texas looks like a little P compared to the Miners' current territory, and I just thought about this, but if you're rooting for a small school today, do you want them to win this all even though it means they're the worst team in the game? Make sure to let me know in the comments, and let's see who wins this one. UCLA needs to score here, which they do, and it was pretty close between them and San Diego State, but in the end, I think they're gonna pull away. The Aztecs have no timeouts left, so they're in a very bad position, but they keep picking up first downs, and their quarterback is literally 9 for 28 today. However, he was still able to get them into the end zone, and on this two-point conversion, he's gonna connect with his receiver, so they are one onside kick away from being back in this, but they are not going to get it. UCLA has been eliminated from this imperialism, and the Aztecs have taken over the southern part of California. We're starting to see some of the worser teams expanding their territory, and I think Washington State could be an interesting one. They could easily pull off the upset at Oregon State, and I want to say I called it that I was able to predict it, but this one is not over yet, so we'll see if they're able to get one last stop on the Beavers and actually pull it off. Their defense has looked a little leaky on these past few plays, and they're giving up another big one, so I think it's pretty obvious what's coming. They're probably going to give up a touchdown, and I can't believe they're spiking it. It's a good thing the Cougars came out in a three-man front, and after that terrible decision on the goal line and this right here, they deserve to lose. For whatever reason, Washington State is continuing to run the ball, and are they aware that they only have eight seconds left to get in field goal range? It doesn't make much sense, but the throw is up, and it's going to be picked off. So the Beavers are going to get the result that they were looking for, and as of now, this is what the full United States looks like. Just a little over 100 teams still remain in this imperialism, and now Vanderbilt is on the clock going to the south. To my surprise, they dominated this game, and UAB didn't score a single point. I honestly thought that one was going to be a pretty tight finish, but the Commodores clearly did not want to be in the running for the worst team. Baylor's located in the center of Texas, so this could have gone many ways, but they're playing at Texas A&M, and Texas A&M easily took care of business. That's unfortunate because I had a lot of good jokes I wanted to use, but it turns out that's what $30 million will get you. Now we head back over to the wheel, and next up is going to be Temple, who has already lost one time in this video, and I think it was to Army. Now they're going to be facing off against Penn State, and I don't know what's going on with the Nittany Lions in this, but they are set to lose again. With no timeouts remaining, this one is already over, and they're a 90 overall team, so this makes absolutely no sense. I thought they would be the first team in the Northeast to get out, but I guess I was wrong. And can you imagine in the end if they were the last team standing? I don't think it's likely to happen, but now I have to root for it. And now the Spartans are traveling to Western Michigan. Well, it looks like we could have another upset on the line today, because this one has gone to overtime, and on third and three, Western Michigan is going to pick it up, plus much more. They are just one defensive stop away from beating the Spartans at home. And here on fourth and five, it looks like they're going to send a little blitz. Nobody gets in, so they pick it up. And the game will probably go to double overtime, but they could still get a stop. I mean, it's fourth and ten, so this is a very important play, but Peyton Thorne throws a laser. And then the game just did this, showing that Western Michigan won. I sim all of the extra points, so I'm going to assume that Michigan State missed it, and they did. That means Western Michigan is going to get out before them, and I'm honestly stunned at how many upsets we've already had. This has to be the best start we've had to an imperialism, and will Mississippi State be able to take down Southern Miss? I assume they would pretty easily, but with 30 seconds left, it is tied up at 28, and Will Rogers has been stuck at midfield. It looks like he's just going to take the dump off, so they're going to have to attempt the field goal for the win, and that is going to be well off. Technically, it gives Southern Miss a chance to go down the field and kick one themselves, and here with about 10 seconds left, they're going to get a little bit closer, and I doubt their kicker has the leg, but he is going to attempt it, and it's also short. After Southern Miss scored on their first overtime possession, Will Rogers is going to throw a dart, and I would assume they're going to get in here as well on their next possession, which they do. They're going to be very fortunate to get out of this game with a win if they can hold on, and here on fourth and goal, Southern Miss has one more chance. They're going with the halfback screen again. This time, the throw is off, and they're going to get in. They just continue to go back and forth, but Southern Miss didn't get their two-point conversion attempt, and Mississippi State won't either. Now, they're having to settle for a field goal on their next possession, and Southern Miss can win with a touchdown. They're only a few yards away, but they're taking a sack. So talk about a costly mistake because now they're probably gonna have to get the field goal, but the wide receiver is gonna get in, and Southern Miss has pulled off the upset. I was not expecting Mississippi State to take over this pretty large chunk of land, but at least the SEC still has some teams representing them. We are also officially just under 100 teams, and Rutgers is the next team that's gonna have to play going up against Penn State. There's no way the Nittany Lions lose again, but I might be wrong again.
again as they're taking a field goal here. That means Rutgers is literally one first down away from pulling off the upset. But Penn State trusted their defense, so here on third and five, let's see if they can get the job done. The halfback screen's going to create a lot of space, and that's going to officially seal it as the Nittany Lions are going to lose for a third time. There is always something weird that happens in these things, and the fact that Penn State still hasn't won is so confusing. Northwestern is now the next team up, and I don't think they've played yet, but they're going to be battling it out for the state of Illinois, and it looks like the Illini are going for a last second comeback. To stay in it, they have to pick up this fourth and goal, and they're not going to be able to, so Northwestern gets the win, and they are no longer a part of the state. They're the third Big Ten team that has struggled in this, and surely Eastern Michigan won't beat whoever they match up against. It had to be one of the two big Michigan schools, and it was pretty close until the end, but Michigan State was able to pull away, putting them out of college football imperialism. That leaves only three teams left in the state of Michigan, and now we're headed down to Georgia, where the Eagles have already lost once. This time, they have to face off against the Bulldogs, and surely the national champions are not about to lose at home to them. There is no way this happens. I'm not sure how they've gotten in this position, but Stetson Bennett isn't hiking the ball, and now their offensive line commits a penalty. The CPU in this game is so weird sometimes, but there is still a chance for Georgia to win it. Stetson Bennett is slinging it deep, and it is picked off. Georgia Southern is going to do it. They have somehow beaten the best team in the nation, and there must be something wrong with NCAA Football 14 Sam. This stuff happens all the time in Dynasty mode, but it is still really strange and confusing. Honestly, either team could win this one, and with a minute left, San Diego State has the ball trailing by two, but they are stuck on a fourth and 11 that they must pick up. Their quarterback is going to bomb it deep, and it is going to be dropped. Technically, they're not out of it because they used their three timeouts to get a stop, but they're pretty much going to have to go all the way on this one play, and it is not going to happen. The Aztecs now have an even larger portion of California, and let's head back over to the wheel where we're going to have Air Force playing again. I'm almost certain they've already played one time in this video, and now they have a chance to take over the rest of Colorado. All they have to do is lose to Colorado State, but their defense came to play, and the Rams' offense has been embarrassing to watch. The quarterback did break a sack there, and he's going to throw this one deep, but that's his only good play of the day, and that'll leave Colorado all being this puke-colored green, while the rest of the United States looks like this for the time being. Make sure to let me know in the comments which team you're rooting for, and it looks like we are going right back to San Diego State, where they're going to be traveling out to Hawaii. With two minutes left, the Rainbow Warriors have the ball. They're on a third and 19, though, and their quarterback takes another sack. So with their three timeouts, you'd think they'd punt it back and then try to get a stop, but they're going for it, and they're not going to get it. This means the Aztecs have been eliminated, and the Rainbow Warriors have taken over even more of mainland USA. I still believe they're one of the favorites to win this imperialism, but if their territory gets too big, that probably won't happen. Now we have Baylor playing, and this one should be a good one. Well, with about two minutes left, the Bears are trailing by nine, which means it's going to be very hard to come back. And they do have all their timeouts, but they are stuck on a fourth and 10, which they are going to pick up. And they'd even go on to score a touchdown on the drive, but they probably need to recover this onside kick and they are not going to be able to do so. On the bright side, they have all their timeouts though. So they could still force a three and out to get the ball back, but Max Duggan's going to be taken off here and he got the first. That's enough to make sure that TCU survives. And Baylor's now definitely the second biggest team in Texas. They've lost both of their matchups, but they have been against tough teams. And now SMU might have a chance to play them as well, which is exactly what is going to happen. However, despite having three attempts now to not be a part of college football imperialism for losers, Baylor looks like they're going to stay in it because they're down by 10 points with 32 seconds left and that is going to seal it. At this rate, they're going to have all of Texas in the next five turns and surely the wheel won't have them play for the third game in a row. USF is in Florida, so they are going to be off the hook, but FAU is not as this one should be very close. As someone that lives in Tampa now, I'd like to see USF get out, but my new city team could be in a little bit of trouble. They've gone back and forth with the Owls and they're on the goal line with a minute remaining where their quarterback is going to take off and somehow he was marked in. This means FAU only has 41 seconds to get in field goal range, but that is not something that's going to be impossible. So we will see what happens. They still have all three of their timeouts. They just need to pick this up, but that's another draw. And USF just needs to hold on tight for two more plays. They're going to get the tackle here, making it fourth and three and FAU is not hiking the ball. I don't understand this. They had all three of their timeouts. Outs, they ended up not using them, and on the final play of the game, it is going to be over. USF is the second team from Florida to get out of this, and on this next wheel spin, it is going to take us to the state of Virginia. Now, even though the Cavaliers play in the ACC, they're not very good, so we'll see if they can take down the Mountaineers. Well, I guess I have to take back what I just said because they just smoked West Virginia, and that was an ugly, ugly loss. Right now, either Wyoming or Memphis is the biggest territory, but that is all still subject to change many times, and Mississippi State has now been landed on, who lost to Southern
Southern Miss in overtime and is now playing Alabama. I don't even understand how this game is close, so don't ask me to explain it, because nothing has made sense in this video. It's pretty much all in the hands of Bryce Young, and on third and 15, he's going to find his tight end. That was a massive play from him, but he is going to take a sack. And on third and 18, with about 50 seconds left, they're not going to pick it up. If Ole Miss beats Alabama, but they couldn't beat Southern Miss, this is full chaos, and he loses the ball. The returner dropped it. I can't believe what we just witnessed, but the Bulldogs might be the worst team now. They choked their overtime game earlier, now they're blowing this one, and Alabama scores the touchdown. If I were a Bulldogs fan, I would be embarrassed right now, and on the final play of the game, the ball is in the air, and it is going to be intercepted. Well, Mississippi State just got a little bit larger, and one of the biggest schools in the game has been eliminated, but don't forget that Georgia ended up losing, so they're still in it. Now we have Kansas facing off against Nebraska, and if the Jayhawks can pick up this third and six, they're going to be able to seal it, but since they weren't able to, the Cornhuskers are going to have a slight chance. However, after some really, really bad play calls like that, the Cornhuskers are on a fourth and two, there's like 10 seconds left, and this one is pretty much over, and they won't even get the spike off to attempt a Hail Mary. That was a terrible ending, and has Nebraska fallen off so far that they think they have a better chance at winning losers in peerlism than a championship? I guess that's another team to watch for, for potentially winning it all. And something's been going on with the Big Ten teams in this. One of them has to be eliminated in this game, though, and Minnesota seems to be the team that's going to come out on top. But if Wisconsin recovers this onside kick, they're going to stay in it, and they're not going to be able to do that. Well, now they hold one of the biggest land masses in the nation, and I'm going to make a very bold prediction here. But for some reason, I feel like a Big Ten team's going to be the last team standing. For now, though, we have to head over to watch Cal versus Nevada, and I was hoping this would be a little bit closer than it was, but because the Wolfpack were 16 overalls worse, this was expected. They're also getting a pretty sizable amount of land, but that's just the way things go. We're going to keep on pushing it, and it's time to watch Purdue play for the first time today. They'll be going up against Indiana, and the Hoosiers showed why they are known as a basketball school, not a football one. That one was never even a contest, and recently, a lot has changed over this entire map. There's about five or six territories that are much larger than everybody else, and we are headed back to Georgia, but this time not for the Bulldogs. Instead, Georgia State will be going over to Auburn, and this one was never even close, but you would not believe which team was the one winning it. Georgia State came into this as a massive underdog, but in the end, just like Georgia Southern, they're going to make sure that they aren't one of the teams that actually wins this thing. Auburn and Georgia should not be in this position, but I am loving the madness, and next up is UNLV. They're going to be heading out from Allegiant Stadium to play somewhere else, and that'll end up being somewhere in Nevada. This one's for the entire state, and with less than two minutes remaining, the Wolfpack have yet to score a single point. Evidently, their offense has struggled, and on fourth and ten, they're not going to get it. So now they control all of their state, plus more. With that result, it feels like we've gone a while without a good game, but maybe Duke can give us one. I sure hope they can. And against East Carolina is a pretty even matchup. However, the Pirates just haven't been able to keep up with the Blue Devils, and on fourth and 21, that is going to be it. Just another game that turns out to be pretty boring, and with that result, we're officially at 80 teams remaining. A lot has happened, but we're only about a third of the way through, and only one Washington team can survive this. After losing to Oregon State earlier, the Cougars made sure not to do that again, and I think it's fair to call that a pretty big upset. I'm still not sure how Michael Penix and the Huskies lost that, but they are still in it, and now Notre Dame is going to be playing, but they should obliterate Indiana. Well, what did I say? It was 52-9, to and it was never even a contest, so Indiana's going to get a little bit bigger, but when you zoom out, they're still not very noticeable. That result does fall in line with the Big Ten losing a lot, though, and we are right back to Nevada, who's already lost twice. This time, they're playing Boise State, and with a minute 14 remaining, they have a lead, but they need to get one final defensive stop, and they almost had it there. If they're able to do so, they're going to finally escape this loser imperialism, and they should have had another pick, but there's still a decent chance that both of those drops could come back to haunt them. I mean, Boise State just got an extra 20 yards, and now their quarterback is slinging it again for a touchdown almost, so it is no surprise that a couple plays later, they're going to get in. However, the Wolfpack are threatening. They could get into field goal range and kick the game-winning kick, so we'll see what happens. And here on third and five, Nate Cox is going to drop back in the pocket. He's going to find the halfback that is going to get taken down. So this one has gone to overtime, and neither team has been stopped yet. Nevada is on a third and four, though, and their quarterback is going to break one sack to get the throw out, but he couldn't hook up with his receiver, so it is fourth down. He throws it, and that's a dot. In the end, both teams have gone back and four, but Boise State was able to get the win, and I didn't get to see it because the game simmed it, but Nate Cox threw a pick. This makes Nevada's territory almost twice as large, and the 70 overall team still one of the favorites to win it all. It seems like we're getting a lot of repeat teams as we just landed on Baylor, and this time, they're playing against Rice. You would think that would mean an easy win for the Bears, but they've got 
gotten obliterated, and this result is just embarrassing. Their other losses have been understandable, but this one is not, and you can't even say they got unlucky because they got beat by 21. Now we're headed over to Pitt. We haven't seen them take the field yet, but they're going to be playing Maryland because it touches this extra tip over here. Well, with about a minute remaining, Pitt has the ball down by four, and I wasn't expecting the Panthers to be in this situation, but they're not out of it yet. Slovis has been delivering dart after dart after dart down the field, and I have a feeling that they're going to get into the end zone as he can't be stopped right now. With no timeouts, though, the only thing he can't do is take a sack or get tackled in bounds because now they have to hurry it up and get a playoff really quickly. Let's see what happens. It's going to be a little bit short, making this fourth and inches with about 10 seconds left huge. They have a guy in motion. He is not snapping the ball. He steps back in the pocket now, and he finds his receiver, but he drops it. He did everything he could have there, but Maryland is still going to get the win. Me, personally, if I'm a Pitt fan, I would be disgusted by that, but at least there is still a very long way to go. For now, we have the two Arkansas schools battling it out, and despite being the much better team, the Razorbacks are trailing at home. I don't understand how KJ Jefferson has let it get to this point, but he has to come up with a comeback now, and he needs to go ahead and hike this ball, but instead, he ran the clock down to 20 seconds, which makes no sense sense, and that is going to be it. The SEC is being represented very well right now, and honestly, I think we're losing big and small schools at the same rate. So far, we haven't seen Wyoming take the field yet, and once again, they don't have to as this arrow is pointing to South Dakota. They get to claim even more land, and they're one of the few teams that have an amazing starting spot. Clemson, however, is not, as they're in the middle of madness, and it's going to be them versus South Carolina. Spencer Rattler tried his best, but this game was always two or three possessions apart, and the Tigers are not going to fall victim to getting upset like some of these other teams. With their exit, there's still 73 teams left, and Eastern Michigan is playing again, this time going north, which will pin them against Central Michigan. With about two minutes left, Eastern Michigan is winning, and on fourth and six, Central Michigan has no choice but to go for it here, which they are going to pick up with the halfback screen. The rivalry matchup couldn't get any closer, and I can't wait to see who comes out on top. They do need a touchdown if they want to win, but they also don't want to score too quick because you don't want to give Eastern Michigan enough time to respond back. After that big gain, they ended up spiking the ball, which doesn't really make any sense, because now they're stuck on a fourth and two that they have to pick up to stay in it, and they don't get it. Since they lost, Central Michigan gets to surround the Wolverines, and there's literally nowhere else that they can go. That's probably good for Michigan, considering they shouldn't lose to Central, but I guess we have seen crazier in this already, and now these two purple teams have to battle it out. James Madison ended up getting beat in an embarrassing fashion, 34-7, to making their territory on the East Coast twice as big. They just moved up from FCS, so they're expected to not do well, but I'm pretty sure this season in real life, they did pretty well. Oddly enough, they have to play again against the Tar Heels, and somehow, after East Carolina made quick work of them, they're in a competitive game. NCAA football never fails to not make any sense to me, but they have a chance to actually tie this and send it to overtime, so they need to pick up this fourth and six to stay in it, and they're able to do so. They have no timeouts remaining, so getting out of bounds like they did on that last play is always huge. After back-to-back -back missed passes, though, they find themselves in a third and ten, which they will pick up. And they have everybody in this stadium on the edge of their seats as they keep on moving it. 35 seconds left, 35 yards to go. They are going to be in bounds here, which is unfortunate because that three yard gain was not worth wasting 15 seconds of game time. They're in a pretty good position though because they can take shots to the end zone and there's the throw, but it's knocked down. Eight seconds left now and they're almost in a Hail Mary formation. This throw is a dot. So we're going to be going into overtime. James Madison ended up scoring on their first possession and now they have the Tar Heels on a fourth and four where they went with the run. So North Carolina is going to lose this game. That'll make them one of the biggest territories on the East Coast, but I highly doubt that is what their program wants. Once again, we've landed on Baylor for like the fifth time, and surely they don't lose to UTEP as well. I mean, they tried their hardest to, but the Miners just couldn't score, so Texas is pretty much all orange now. I can't believe it took Baylor like five attempts, but they are out, and now we get to see what Tennessee can do in this thing. They're going to be going into Memphis's funky territory, and they're going to leave college football imperialism as a one-and-done team. This was a little reminder to me that Kentucky is still in it. And hopefully we can draw Memphis soon because they're not playing well. Florida State is a name that I don't think we've heard of yet. And they're going to be going up against Troy. I'm not going to claim that the Seminoles are back, but they did get the win. And I'm impressed that they didn't go ahead and embarrass themselves at least once. Headed back over to the wheel now where we are going to land on Texas State. And wherever this arrow lands, it's a good chance it's going to Utah. I mean, they're surrounded in almost every direction. And these teams are a very even matchup. In fact, it looks like the Miners are finally going to get a win as 
is they get the stop here and it was a long time coming but they finally done it the state now belongs to texas state and utep has officially been wiped off of the map for a while it looked like they were going to win it all so that's surprising and now we get to revisit auburn who lost earlier on this time they're taking on uab and the tigers have scored just seven points with a minute left it's safe to say that bo Nix made the right decision in getting out of there and that turnover is going to be it uab is going to beat auburn and what is going on in the southeast with all of these sec teams there's five or six of them left that have already lost a game or two and now it's time for troy to take the field again but this time they're playing mississippi state well i can't act like it's a surprise but the trojans are going to lose again and just like that one of the sec teams has gotten out of this i feel like so far no conference has really stood out and bowling green's going to be one of the first teams from the mac to play they'll be going down to miami ohio and their defense has run the red hawks off of the field as they've gotten stop after stop there is another example of it and now that bowling green is no longer a part of this i can officially say we're halfway through loser imperialism with 63 teams left though there's still a lot of action that needs to go on and georgia tech will be the next team playing heading up to the north that'll pin them up against memphis and once again the tigers are not in a good situation they're down by six on a fourth and eight and they go with the halfback draw so georgia tech can end it with one first down which they're gonna get here so memphis is left with one of the weirdest looking territories yet i mean surely at some point they're gonna get a win but i think they've lost like five in a row now so maybe not kansas state will be taking on nebraska next though and the Cornhuskers have scored three points on the Wildcats in a full game. They must have gotten their offensive playbook from Iowa because that is the only way it is possible. Now they want to score. And hang on, if they recover this, they still have a chance, but they aren't going to be able to, so Kansas State wins. And that makes Nebraska one of the biggest territories. So far, my prediction of a Big Ten school winning it is still holding strong. And now the Arizona State Sun Devils are playing for the first time. The arrow technically hits the tip of Utah here, so we got ourselves a Pac-12 matchup, and the Utes are going to take this one pretty comfortably. Despite losing their first game, they're now off of the map, and that is expected from a good program like Utah, but I'm rooting for as much chaos as possible, so that's unfortunate. FAU will be playing Miami next, and I honestly can't believe this is such a close game. With a minute remaining, Miami trails by three, and they need to score here, which they do, but FAU will still have a chance to respond right back, and here on third and five, their quarterback is going to be taking off for the first down, getting to about the 40, which was much needed because their offense is struggling, and now with 10 seconds left, they're so far away from the end zone, it's pretty much over, and that drop into an interception is going to seal it. The Hurricanes survive getting upset, and FAU has lost yet another game. They're pretty much trapped in the bottom right corner of the map, so there's a good chance they're going to be stuck there for a while. And now we're going to get Tulsa versus Nebraska. Honestly, at this point, I just feel bad for Cornhusker fans. And they even punted, giving up at the end of the game. That'll leave the middle of the U.S. covered in red, and we have three or four pretty dominant territories. Of course, those probably won't hold up for very long, though, but Virginia Tech is nowhere near any of them. So for now, it's them versus Wake Forest. I was hoping for a good game, but the Hokies couldn't deliver. So they're just gonna get a little bit bigger. I want some more good finishes though, because those are the most entertaining. And I don't think we have seen Tulane play a game in this yet. They have no choice but to go up against Troy. And the Trojans are gonna come out, control the clock, and be able to take down the green wave at home. This changes everything in the Southeastern region, as there's honestly very few teams left there that aren't good. With this spin, Texas State can pretty much go anywhere and if they can't beat Houston they're gonna get even more of Texas now I know the Bobcats odds are terrible but they do have a chance with a little bit of time left and can you imagine the scenes if they go 80 yards to beat Houston well that couldn't happen because the time ran out but at least they were able to reclaim even more of their state pretty much all they have to do to finish it off is beat Texas but for now we have to head over to Ohio where the Bearcats are gonna be playing the Bobcats like expected it was not much of a game at all and I'm starting to get desperate for a good one it feels Feels like it's been so long since we've had an overtime thriller or something. And honestly, I shouldn't even be spinning the arrow right now. There was no other team that Texas could have possibly played. And honestly, it is a lot closer than I was expecting, but it's still over. The Bobcats just haven't been able to get anything going offensively, and it shows. They now pretty much control all of Texas, though. And with that, I'd say it's safe to call them a favorite to win it all. Coastal Carolina has a lot of matchups they could end up drawing, and they ended up getting the Gamecocks. I was expecting Spencer Rattler to run away with this one, but he's done quite the opposite, and Coastal Carolina is going to win their first game. Again, the SEC schools have been struggling for some reason, and my favorite team, Kentucky, is one of those colleges. Whoever Ohio State gets, they should end up railing, and Ohio isn't going to stand a chance. The Bobcats are going to fall to the Buckeyes 48-10, to and that means Mac country has fully taken over the state. Legitimately, all of those teams could be the worst in the country, so it's going to be interesting.
interesting to see how this entire thing plays out. Marshall is going to be traveling to Virginia Tech next, and assuming the Hokies can't pull off a nine-point comeback, Marshall is going to win. It's fourth and four, so this is one of the most decisive plays of the game, and it's knocked down, making this East Coast region way more difficult than anybody expected it to be. With 50 teams left, this is what the United States looks like, and the next team that's going to be taking the field is going to be Wyoming. They have yet to play, but they've conquered multiple territories, and they were just able to get even more land. They've gotten the most land without stepping onto the field once, and they just got landed on again, so they actually have to play, which should be interesting versus Colorado State. Well, all it took for them was one game, but they've come out and gotten the win, so I guess Wyoming is like that, and that instantly forms the biggest territory. Congratulations to Colorado State, I guess, and now it's time for Michigan to most likely get out. They have no choice but to play against Central Michigan, and if Central wins this, I'll replace the J.J. McCarthy jersey with a different one. Unfortunately, though, that didn't even come close to potentially happening, so I guess Central technically runs the state. For real, though, let me know in the comments which jersey should replace this one, and now we are headed over to North Carolina, who lost early on, giving them all of this land that's about to go to Charlotte. I mean, I'm normally optimistic, but I'm also a realist, and it looks like it's actually a close game, but don't let this score fool you. Charlotte scored back-to-back -back touchdowns in a last-second effort to make a comeback here, but unless they can go the length of the field in 15 seconds, it's not going to matter, but that is a huge throw. That alone puts them in Hail Mary range, and their quarterback is not going to get the throw off. Well, now they have a big portion of the East Coast, and I think besides a few teams, the ACC is completely out of this. They seem to have been the most successful conference so far, and now it's time for Toledo versus Indiana. With 24 seconds remaining, the Hoosiers are trailing by three, but they have the ball, and that's a big throw, because all they really need is about 25 more yards to get into field goal range, and if they're able to do that, they can send this one into overtime. The throw is up. It is going to be completed, so all they have to do is spike it, and their kicker should easily do his job. Toledo scored on their first possession, so now we get to see if Indiana can do the same, and I can't believe Dexter Williams the second just took that sack, making this fourth and 20 impossible to pick up. He's going to turn the ball over, and to rub it in, the Toledo corner is going to take this to the house. If Indiana can't beat Toledo, they could be in some trouble, and I'm not going to let you all forget about my Big Ten prediction. There's still a pretty decent chance one of those teams ends up winning this, but let's see which of these two teams gets all of this territory. This feels like one of Nevada's best chances to get the win, and they're not going to be able to come away with the onside kick, but since they have three timeouts, this one's not over until Utah State gets a first down. It looks like that's that's going to happen pretty easily though as it does right here and they already have so much land that this barely makes a difference besides colorado state obviously i think they have the most and there's very few teams remaining out west that are weaker than them louisiana monroe is known for being one of the worst teams so we'll see what happens in this little matchup it makes sense that this is a rivalry game but that doesn't mean it's going to be competitive as the bulldogs played terribly i did not think ulm was going to win let alone by 25 but i'm pretty sure very few things that have happened have made actual sense. For example, Washington's still in it because they lost to Washington State, and either them or Oregon will get out here. Ignoring the terrible jersey combinations, it's fourth and five, and the Huskies aren't going to get it, so the Ducks are very close to being able to run out the rest of the clock, making this a huge third and three, but it's a bad throw, so Washington gets one more chance, and on fourth and five, again, they're going to actually pick it up this time. I think that throw is going to lead to the Huskies getting in, but with three timeouts and 33 seconds left, Bo Nix has plenty of time to make something happen. However, instead, he decided it was a better idea to run out the rest of the clock and take it to overtime. Because of that, I believe they deserve to lose, especially running the ball, putting their defense in a terrible position as they're only going for three. Washington ended up winning off of one sim play, and I wish they'd let me watch it, but all I know is it was a dot. I wasn't really expecting Oregon to still be in it, but both of those teams are really good and somebody had to stay, so it's honestly not too big of a deal with this many teams left. Stanford's going to be playing for the first time against Nevada, and it looks like the Wolfpack are going to fall short again as they're running the ball, even though they're down with 30 seconds left and have no timeouts. So you can kind of see the play calling that got them here. And once again, they're going to lose. I mean, they are outmatched by about everybody around them, but Stanford was probably one of their best chances at winning. And now we've landed on New Mexico, who is also one of the worst teams. They're going to be taking on Arizona State, and words cannot describe how terrible this team really is. That result alone should give Nevada some hope. And they're one of the few teams out west the Wolfpack could probably beat. As for Navy, they're on the complete opposite side of the country, and I highly doubt they're going to beat Pitt. In fact, the Panthers are going to come out and double their score, which means they're going to be eliminated from college football imperialism. With that result, there's just 40 teams left, and about half of them are big schools, so anything can happen. I literally have no idea who's going to be the biggest loser, but can you imagine if Colorado
Colorado State is able to beat Nebraska. I am at a loss for words as it is 20 to 3 and the Cornhuskers are set to lose. They're a way higher overall team than Colorado State and they're at home, but Scott Frost is their head coach on this game's roster, so maybe that's the issue. They have more territory than anybody else in the United States for the time being, but the good news is because they have so much land, they're probably going to lose it. All of it makes them a big target, so it's bound to happen, but for now we get to see tiny Louisiana schools battle it out. With 50 seconds remaining, Louisiana Tech's going for the tie, but they couldn't pick up that fourth down run, so assuming they don't get a stop here, they're going to lose. On third and inches, Chris Smith is going to take it for a few, making it so Louisiana Tech loses yet another rivalry game at home. Of all the teams remaining, 11 still haven't played once, and Syracuse was one of those teams, but they just got landed on, and somehow they still don't have to hop into a game. There are a lot of open northern states they could end up taking, but that would not help them in the end as they need to win to get out of this. Now, Memphis is one of the most interesting teams we've had, and if they're able to take down Auburn, they're going to be able to get out. Both of these teams have lost games that they shouldn't have, and of the two Tiger colleges, it seems like Auburn just wanted it a little bit more today. They've put up 27, while Memphis has only put up 10. This gives Memphis territory that is almost stretching like the Mississippi River, and if they can't get a win soon, their land will eventually run north to south. For now, though, we have to go see what West Virginia can do, and it's going to be them versus Navy. They should end up destroying them, and I wish I could end up saying it was close, but there was a big overall difference between these teams. Sometimes that seems to matter, and other times it doesn't, but after seeing how terribly Navy played in that game, maybe I should adjust my favorite on who I think will win it all. NC State's gonna have a chance to get out versus Charlotte, but with four minutes left, they're falling behind by eight. I don't know what's been going on with Devin Leary, but he's had a terrible game as he is going to throw what should have been another pick, and with a minute and a half left, his team has the ball again, but that was a terrible fourth down play call. The Wolfpack will have a chance to get it back if they can get a stop here, which they do, but with what I've seen from NC State, I really don't see them pulling off the comeback, and Devin Leary throws another interception. Charlotte is going to pull off a massive upset, and I can't believe how many good teams are still remaining in the South. With 35 colleges remaining, most of the best ones come from this area, and what will most likely happen is they're going to beat up on each other. Texas State is not one of those good teams, though, and they're going to be headed west, so either them or New Mexico is about to get out. Well, the Lobos are definitely one of the worst teams, as this is not even a contest, and I can't believe they just went out and lost by 25 to Texas State. All 12 teams from Texas are now off of the board, though, and New Mexico is going to be playing again where they're going to be headed west. Either them or Nevada is about to get out, and when the Wolfpack have almost tripled your score, you know that you are a terrible team. Nevada has lost game after game after game, but they were able to come out in this one and win by 12 points, so it took them a while, but they have finally gotten off of the map. I feel like New Mexico has to win a game at some point, but it might be a long time before we see that happen. The final two Florida teams are up next, and UCF kept a 2-3 possession lead throughout the entire game. This means the Owls' next matchup is probably going to be Georgia, and there's no way the Bulldogs lose another game. Tulane's going to get a crack at someone, though, and it's going to be up to the Northeast, which means Memphis has another chance to finally get out. They've had to have lost at least five different times by now, but with exactly a minute remaining versus the Green Wave, they have a six-point lead. This is their chance, and all they have to do is hold on by getting some defensive stops, and that inbounds tackle is going to be huge as it's fourth and nine, and this is going to be short. The Tigers are officially out, and it's been a long time coming, but I am sure that their fans are relieved. There's a lot of green and red across the country right now, and just 30 more teams have to be eliminated before we have a winner. We're getting closer and closer to that final big game, and Tulane isn't going to have any chance to rest. They are going to get the home field advantage, though, and that made all of the difference as they have doubled the Illini's score up to this point. There's almost a 0% chance Illinois can come back from this, and Chase Brown is going to run out of bounds, so just one turn after gaining all of this land, Tulane is going to lose it. I don't even know what to expect anymore, and of course, Illinois now has to play back-to-back -back ones. It should be good, though, as they're going to be going up against Nebraska, and with a minute left, the Cornhuskers could go down the field and steal this game. They're on a third and six already, though, 47 seconds left now on the clock, and that is a good check down, but because Joshua Fleeks couldn't get the first, a lot of clock is going to run off, and hopefully that isn't costly in the end. Every second is very valuable when you are operating on limited time, and what an amazing throw by Casey Thompson. He's gotten his team down to the 10, and could this be the time that Nebraska finally gets it done? He is moving around in the pocket, and he's going to find the open receiver, so the Cornhuskers are just 12 seconds away from finally getting off of the map. All they have to do is get a stop on this Hail Mary, and I don't think they're going to get the throw off, so Illinois is going to become the biggest team in the country, and they're an 86 overall team, so I don't know how they keep losing. They're covering about 50% of the United States, though, and let's see what direction Virginia Tech is going to have to go. Well, 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 it is 
is them versus my Wildcats, and I'm not gonna lie, it isn't looking too good for us. With a minute and a half left, the Wildcats have the ball, but they are trailing by three, and Will Levis just threw an interception. Are you kidding me? There were legitimately like four dudes around him, so I don't know why he threw that ball, and it's gonna be over. Virginia Tech is going to win. That is embarrassing, and I guess Big Blue Nation just got a little bit bigger. One of the last imperialisms, Kentucky almost won, but now they're doing this, and it makes no sense to me at all. Wisconsin versus Iowa could get interesting, though, and honestly, for these two teams, this is probably a very high-scoring game for them. It looks like the Hawkeyes only scoring 10 points is gonna bite them in the butts, though, as it is 4th and 14, and they're not gonna get it. Their only opportunity to still have a chance is get a stop on 3rd and 3, but they're not gonna be able to do so, and since they're just starting to expand, could they be one of the favorites to win it all? I feel like there's actually a real possibility that could happen, but who knows, I could also just be a big-time hater, and Penn State is finally gonna have an opportunity to redeem themselves. However, with a minute and a half left, they're trailing by four, which means they have to get a stop here, and they're gonna be able to do so, but they're not gonna have much time to go down the field and score a touchdown. Sean Clifford is gonna have to pull a miracle out of his back pocket if he wants to get it done, but with drops like that, his receivers are not helping him, and did he just run out of bounds? They marked it like he got the first, but I still think that was way too close for comfort. With 28 seconds remaining, though, they need to get something going, and Sean Clifford is gonna sling it for a big gain here. That is exactly what I was talking about. I'm sure they're going four verts at this point, and that is a dot. It looks like we are gonna be headed to overtime, which is something I wasn't expecting. And on the Nittany Lions first drive, it is third and 14. They are not going to pick it up. So that is not good as they're putting their defense in a bad position. Down on the goal line, they are gonna have to come up clutch, and with too much time in the pocket, they're not able to. Once again, Penn State is going to lose, and there's no way that anybody thought they would still be in it by now. They're probably a top 10 to 15 team on this game, yet they are struggling massively, and Ole Miss is finally taking the field. It's gonna be them versus Illinois, and I can't believe the Fighting Illini actually came out and played this well. They're gonna take down Jackson Dart and the Rebels, and with 25 teams remaining in college football loser imperialism, this is what the United States currently looks like. Of the remaining colleges, 12 of them play in a Power 5 conference, but I'm sure they're gonna end up getting out pretty quickly. For example, Oregon versus New Mexico. The Lobos can try their hardest, but just keeping it 100, they were never gonna make it close. Now they just have an even larger portion of the US, and the first Power 5 conference to have no teams left is the Pac-12. I'm sure that is also something that you could not have predicted, but the MAC has the most teams that are still remaining, and after putting up 49 points, the Bobcats are gonna be able to take down the Red Hawks. With that result, there is one less MAC team, and now they're tied with the SEC as both have five teams left. I don't know how that is even possible, but I guess it has to do with geography, and Miami, Ohio is gonna have to play back-to-back -back games. They could actually get their win, though, as they have a three-point lead with a minute left, but they're gonna need to get a stop on Ball State, and that's gonna force a fourth and one. Here it is. They've snapped the ball. The throw is up, and it is gonna be completed. In a matter of seconds, Miami, Ohio went from being in the driver's seat to just hoping that they don't give up a touchdown, and I feel like Ball State is about to get in here, but that throw was way off. Their quarterback is gonna need to keep it down if they wanna actually reach the end zone, and now they're down to the two. They're gonna waste it down by spiking it, though, and now we're gonna get overtime. I don't know what happened, but it's saying Miami, Ohio won, and evidently, it's because the Ball State kicker missed an extra point. They were going back and forth in overtime, but evidently, he shanked his kick, and that's like the second or third time in this video we have seen that happen. FAU just got landed on, though, and I think we know what's about to happen. Georgia is going to rip them a new one, and I'm honestly surprised it was this close. I'm not sure why Georgia has performed so terribly since they're like a 97 overall, but they're gonna get the win still, and all of their fans can breathe a sigh of relief. They should have never been in it for this long, and this is Kentucky's chance to finally get a win. They're gonna be playing against Ole Miss, though, and with a minute remaining, Ole Miss has the ball in a tie game, but they're not gonna pick this up, which will force them to take a field goal and give the ball back to the Wildcats. Will Levis needs to take advantage of this situation, but so far, he has not done that, making this a third and 13, where he just throws another interception. I can't believe it, but Kentucky's gonna lose again. And now my favorite team is the biggest college on the map. Surely at some point, they're gonna be able to get a win, but it honestly shouldn't have even taken them this long. FAU has another matchup, this time against South Carolina, and they went out and put up an entire three points. Hopefully they enjoy their continued expansion, because they're starting to look like the worst team in the country. Oklahoma hasn't played in forever, and I honestly forgot they were here, but they should take care of business against New Mexico, and I can't believe I'm saying it, but it's close, and with three minutes left, New Mexico, down by 10, decided it was smart to punt the ball back to Oklahoma instead of going for it on fourth and 10. By the time they did get it back, they have it on their own one-yard line, so this could be a lot of trouble. And they've gotten 
blown out by every team, so why is this one close? Oklahoma is much better than their previous opponents, but I guess it doesn't matter, because nothing that happens in college football imperialism ever makes any sense, and that's going to end the game. They were finally able to get a big play, but it's just not going to be enough to come back down by 10 with no time left, so they're going to add on just a little bit more land to their territory. That leaves us with just seven of the 18 schools being big ones, and Appalachian State is a small one, so maybe they'll take one out. It turns out that they just drew Kentucky, and there's no way we lose again. Honestly, the fact that it's a five-point game with a minute and a half remaining is very concerning, because with one big play, we could all of a sudden be losing, but on fourth and one, we are going to get the stop, so now we should be able to run out most of the clock. The only thing I rooted for in this was my team not to be the worst team in NCAA football. Why did they make it this difficult? We'll never know the answer to that, but that first down is going to seal it, and that result actually changes everything. The smaller schools are really starting to take over, and will NC State be able to get out with a win here? They're playing against FAU, so I would think so, and unless the Owls can pull off a last second miracle, they're going to get even more the East Coast. It's 4th and 18, 30 seconds left, the throw isn't getting out, so the result we expected is what happened, and yet another large school is going to be free. I always figured this would be a battle of the tiniest colleges, but after so many upsets, I started to think a big school could actually win it. Iowa is going to be going to Central Michigan next, and the Hawkeyes held them to 6 points. So with that result, we have narrowed down the map to just 15 teams, and 4 of the remaining ones haven't stepped onto the field one time. I find that to be crazy, but it's actually normal for imperialism, and if your team doesn't get drawn, they never have a chance to get a win. Louisiana Tech's arrow is actually going to hit the tip of Arkansas here, so instead of playing Appalachian State, they're playing the Razorbacks, and the final SEC team remaining is going to get out. I honestly just want to get some close games again, and I think we're going to get some, but we can't have any more lopsided matchups. For example, if Akron lands against another Mac school, it should be good, and that's what we're going to get when they take on Ball State. With a minute and a half left, Akron is trailing by four, but they have the ball and a chance to take the lead on this drive, so we'll see what DJ Irons can cook up there in the pocket. He is finding his receiver over the middle for a huge gain, and the Zips honestly might score too soon if they're not careful about the clock. I guess they don't really mind, as that will give them a three-point lead, and evidently their kicker missed the extra point because it is 16 to 14. For some reason, Ball State isn't in a rush either. They should have taken a timeout, but because the computer isn't too bright, they ran the clock down the two seconds, and that is going to be it. The Zips only had to play once, but they did take care of business, and now we're down to just 13 teams remaining. I'm guessing that New Mexico isn't going to win whoever they match up against, but them versus Appalachian State could get good. They're both pretty low overall teams, and if the Lobos can score a touchdown on this drive, they will be taking the lead, but considering how bad their offense has been throughout this entire thing, that will most likely be much easier said than done. I mean, Miles Kendrick couldn't even hit a simple check down there, and on 4th and 5, with it all on the line, he got bumped by his running back, but he stayed in the pocket, and he did deliver a good pass. His pocket awareness looked absolutely terrible, but it doesn't really matter if you're able to get the job done and run for an extra five. New Mexico just needs 20 more yards, and that throw is going to be off, but it looked like he had an open receiver, and if he can't convert this fourth down, it's going to be very hard for him to sleep at night. Jameer Sanders does get it, though, so they are moving the ball first and goal now. He does take a sack, and this would be a great time to use a timeout, but they're going to spike the ball instead. They most likely have two chances to get into the end zone, and this throw is going to be knocked down, so whether or not New Mexico wins a game or not is all going to come down to this, and he steps up in the pocket. He takes off. The throw is going to be short, though, so Appalachian State is going to survive, and the U.S. is pretty much all red now. Penn State has to be the biggest program that's still in this, and can you imagine the scenes if they end up being the last team? That would be something, but for now, New Mexico is playing again, and San Jose State is going to go one and done as they double up the Lobo score. At this point in the video, I've pretty much run out of things to say, but if you enjoy these imperialism ones, make sure you hit that like button, and let's say if we get to like 5,000 likes, I'll do another one. These take a ton of time, but I think they're really fun, and I honestly don't know which of these teams is worse. With a little under two minutes remaining, Navy is trailing by seven, but they are moving the ball down the field, and for some reason, I have a feeling that they're going to end up sending this one into overtime by getting into the end zone. That is a huge play, and the option is what works with them, so I'm expecting it here, and they're not going to get in. That extra yard could help them get in on this play, though, and now we have a tie game. FAU does have a chance to go down and get a field goal, though, to avoid overtime, and this face mask penalty changes everything. That's going to put the Owls at the 40, so they probably only need about 10 more yards to get into field goal range. That'll be about 7, 8, 9, 10 of it, and it looks like Navy's going to come very close to winning, but they're going to get the sack, and FAU has a timeout, but they're not going to use it. I cannot believe how much the Owls are choking right now, but they're going to settle for a field goal, and Navy could win it with a touchdown. The option run is freeing up a lot of space. Daniel Jones gets inside the five, and he is playing like he wants 
wants it more on this pitch. He's going to take it and he's going to fight his way into the end zone, making it so Navy is officially out of this and they just avoided being one of the final 10 teams remaining. There's a lot of diversity here, but the MAC conference has the most teams and there's three of them left. So one of those is probably going to be a favorite. New Mexico has another opponent first though, and it's Louisiana Tech. So in like their 10th game, will they finally get a win? No, because they're about to give up a touchdown and there it is. So unless Miles Kendrick can pull off a miracle, they're going to lose yet again. They've been in so many close games, so you'd think they'd come out on top of at least one of these, but it still hasn't happened yet, and it honestly might never. I mean, they've made like 75% of the U.S. red, and my expectations of them are very, very low. I'm almost certain that Kent State is one of the teams that hasn't played yet, and they're going to be taking on a conference opponent in Ball State. The good news is, with less than two minutes remaining, it is tied up at 14, and after getting a defensive stop there, Kent State has the ball, and they're going to pick up the first down off of the option. That was a massive run because they're going to keep the ball in their hands and all they need is a field goal. You can only expect them to stall in this situation though because it's third and four and they didn't want to give the ball back to Ball State in case they didn't pick this up. So it does make sense, but it's going to be much harder to get in field goal range now, especially with dump offs. And I guess we're going to be headed into overtime unless they pull off the miracle here, but they don't. Kent State scored on their first overtime possession and now Ball State is in a fourth and one situation where they're going to score. Both teams ended up scoring on their first drive, but what is the Ball State quarterback doing? That was a terrible sack to take. It is fourth and 27 now, and they're not going to get any points. Kent State can easily end it with a field goal, and honestly, I don't know why they're even passing here, but that's it. So for like the third time in this video, Kent State loses in heartbreaking fashion. That'll leave us with just eight colleges, and we are getting very close to having one team standing. The Cardinals are playing another game now, this time going to the South, and they're just going to avoid Indiana to get into a game which will be against New Mexico. Both of these teams have struggled a lot, and at the end of the third quarter, both teams were scoreless. Now, it looks like New Mexico is going to get in here, and after a few more failed drives, Ball State will do the same, but this has still been a terrible offensive game, and on third and five, the New Mexico quarterback takes a sack. Ball State has a chance to go down the field and get the win, but they're going to be held to a three and out, and it's going to be going into overtime because both of these offenses are incompetent. New Mexico might even find a way to not get three points here. On third and four, their quarterback takes a sack, so we'll see if their kicker has the leg for it, and he surprisingly does. I don't know what happened, but the Lobos are celebrating, and I didn't even mean to sim a play, but apparently Ball State fumbled the ball and I'm not able to watch it. Just like that, they've lost another game that they shouldn't have and I'm still shocked that the Lobos actually got a win. Somehow, Ball State is playing again though and this time it'll be against FAU. With a minute and seven seconds remaining, they are trailing by six but they do have the ball and I don't understand why they're spiking it because they still have three timeouts and that was just a waste of a down. At least they get the first here though. So the drive stays alive and they are gonna need a touchdown so they do need to move pretty fast. That's another big game and I don't think quarterback John Paddock wants to lose yet another one. He is slicing apart this FAU defense with just throw after throw after throw for 10 plus yards. And I just realized why they didn't use a timeout earlier because the Owls have three timeouts, but the Cardinals have none. So that makes more sense. And they just can't afford to be tackled in bounds or take a sack at this point, which is what they're going to do. They need to at least get the spike off and that'll set up one last play for them, but they're 15 yards out of the end zone. And what is this play called? Ball State manages to lose again. And they are literally taking over about everything. They've also left us with three power five schools and three regular ones, so it'll be interesting to see what Indiana can do here. Obviously, they're going to have to play the Cardinals, and both teams are 77 overall. With 45 seconds left, Ball State is punting the ball back to Indiana, but they have a four-point lead, which is wild. And are the Hoosiers really about to lose to the team that hasn't been able to beat anybody? I would think not, but I also don't see Dexter Williams the second taking his team down the field in 34 seconds, especially with checkdowns like that that just keep the clock running. There's not much that they can really do in this situation, and spiking the ball is ineffective if it takes you five seconds to do it. I don't understand that, and why on earth did they just call a halfback draw? They didn't even go for the Hail Mary, but they just gave up instead. And of our final five teams, two of them are from the Big Ten. I know I predicted it, but I wasn't expecting it to actually happen, and Indiana's gonna have one last chance to win against Central Michigan. Checking in here with a second quarter update where the Hoosiers are about to fall behind 20-0 to zero in a terrible fashion. I don't know what they are doing right now, but it's safe to say it never got better for them as they lose 30 34 to 7. We really might have a Big Ten team win it all. And this is not the imperialism you want to win because you're the biggest loser. Boston College hasn't been landed on all day, but they finally get a chance. And they're not even going to have to play. Instead, they're just going to get to claim some territory. And they've always had this cheat code location, but it's not working out for them today. Because they haven't been landed on, they might end up being the worst team. And the closest team to that arrow has to be Penn State. If this is the game that the Hoosiers win, I'm not going to know what to do. But that's not going to happen as the Nittany Lions finally finally went out and did something.
something. 49 to 14 is a big difference, and it would have been comical if Penn State lost that, but they've been due a win for a while. Now, there are simply three teams remaining, and whoever this doesn't land on will be in the championship, but Hawaii did not get lucky. They're gonna have to go against Indiana, and that was dumb to spin the wheel because there's no way they could have reached Boston College. A ton of upsets have gotten us a weird final three, but so far, it is not looking good for the Rainbow Warriors as Indiana is actually doing a good job. Nearing the end of the fourth quarter, they still haven't gotten onto the board once, which is extremely surprising, but their quarterback is 10 for 38. They've gotten less than 100 total yards on the day, and the Hoosiers are finally going to get their win. Well, I definitely wouldn't have predicted this, but we have our last two teams, and the wheel will simply decide who gets the home field advantage. It turns out Hawaii is traveling to Boston College, and this could be like a Georgia TCU final game. I shouldn't say championship because this is technically a loser bowl, and Hawaii's quarterback has already thrown two interceptions today, so it'll probably be over sooner rather than later. Approaching halftime, they're down 24 to 0, and they're going for it on 4th and 10, but they're not going to be able to get it. And after a very long episode of college football loser imperialism, the Rainbow Warriors turn out to be the worst team in the game. One final time, I have to go in and erase a college off the map, and for the first time ever, a team won imperialism when they probably didn't want to.